Good morning and welcome to Church of the Palms. We're so glad you found your way to us today. The Church of the Palms, our mission is to love God and love neighbor, which Jesus said were the two greatest commandments. Our prayer is that these two commands guide everything that we do, our worship, our life together, and our service to the community near and far. This morning's service is our sanctuary worship service. Lyrics to the hymns will be on your screen, as well as scripture texts when the message has begun. You can also access our bulletin on churchofthepalms.org right on our home page. For those who enjoy worshiping in a more contemporary fashion, there is a contemporary service held on campus. Whichever way you like to worship, we hope you can share the opportunity with friends and family who might be searching for a church home. If you'd like more information about any of the announcements mentioned in today's service, feel free to give our office a call or visit us online. Our website is also a great way to learn more about our mission to love God and love neighbor and all about our small groups, classes, and community outreach efforts, some of which you can attend online. If you'd like to financially support Church of the Palms, there are several ways you can support our mission to love God and love neighbor. One of the easiest is online giving, the options of which you will find posted later in the service. We're so glad you chose to join us this morning. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. Good morning. Welcome to the Church of the Palms. My name is Steve Rao and I serve as an elder on the Building and Grounds Committee in our congregation. Let us now prepare our hearts for worship as we bow our heads for the prayer of invocation. Fill us, gracious God, with a sense of your abiding presence. Awaken our spirits to realities unseen. Turn us from the dullness of our fear-filled grasping for security and help us to live with, your, with trust in you. Expand among us such mutual regard and encouragement as will build up community and lead us all to live in the light. May faith and love dominate our, all of our relationships as we enter into the joy of serving in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us praise God through our worship.
in body or spirit, please stand for the responsive call to worship. Lift up your eyes, seeking to know your God. Attune your spirit to the one in whom we dwell. We belong to the day when we have faith. We live confidently in the hope of salvation. Faithfulness gives us a sense of greater abundance. Doing justice adds to our sense of worth and dignity. Let us worship God. As children of God, we come to God in our joys, in our sorrows, in our fears, and our guilt. Yet knowing that God loves us at all times and embraces us, let us pray our confession together. We are reluctant to face your judgment, all-knowing God. We know we have not fully invested the talents you have entrusted to us. We hide them and hoard them, retreating into false sense of security. We live in the nighttime of self-protection rather than in the light of full participation in loving, faithful service. We seek to escape your wrath by shrinking from the rather, rather than investing ourselves in the task to which you call us. Have mercy on us, O God. We want to the children of the day, your day. Help us in Jesus' name, amen. Now let us continue our confession in silence. Amen. God hears our prayers. God sends Jesus Christ. God delivers us. God cares for us. God restores us. God loves us still. We believe in God's grace and in our salvation. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel.
Now, as God's forgiven children, let us affirm our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now let us greet one another in Christ's name as the children come forward for children's moment. Good morning, everyone. Look at all these kids. Um, so last night, we had an event on campus. You probably didn't see evidence of it out in the courtyard because we did a little differently. But we had the homeless sleepover out with our fourth and fifth grade students. And um, we had some brave and very energetic teenagers that um, helped with it. Actually, they helped lead it. And if you could stand up, if you were in the chill, if you um, slept in a box or maybe didn't sleep last night, <laughs> please stand up. Okay, I know, right? So we had we had um, our teenagers, our our student um, leaders, um, Claire and Sean and Chase, Devin and Brian, all help with this event. And something that we've been doing, I know I've been doing it for nine years, and um, it is a tradition nationwide. It's the homeless sleepover. Um, it's an awareness of homelessness in our community, in the communities all over. And um, it's always the weekend before Thanksgiving. And we, I know that we've been doing it over 25 years here at Church of the Palm. So um, we are going to have uh, the teens talk a little bit about what we learned last night, right? Okay, Sean, take it away. This is an overnight experience that helps us learn about homelessness and what scarcity in our community looks like. <clears throat> we hung out with some fourth and fifth grade kids for the last 15 hours to teach the kids about what it means to be homeless, how we might help people, and what scarcity in our community truly is. Here are some of the things we learned overnight. Okay. Our key verse for our homeless sleepover comes from the book of Matthew. Whatever you do unto the least of these, you do unto me. We learn homelessness people come in all sizes, colors, and ages. 
25% of homeless people are children. We also learned that every single person is a child of God. In what way was our experience like being homeless? We slept in cardboard boxes last night and on the floor. How was it different? We had lots to eat. We ate McDonald's and we ate <laughs> s'mores and lots of snacks. We had a lot of tape and a lot of boxes too. We had cozy blankets, sleeping bags, flashlights, and friends. We got to play fun games together in the courtyard and gym. <laughs> Night games also with the teenagers. <laughs> we learned that it means two things to be in the hands of Christ in a broken world. Hands are to help and hands are to pray. How can we help? Ring the Salvation Army bell to collect money and carry granola bars and water to give away. Adopt a Salvation Army angel and shop for them. Donate money to our food pantry to help the hungry. Be kind when we see a homeless person. Maybe smile, say hello, give a gift card to a fast food restaurant or Publix. We all, know, we all need to do our part too. Love others, right. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right, we're going to say a prayer, and then we'll go upstairs. Dear God, thank you for all that we get to do to love other people. Help us to remember that there are people among us who don't have um, what we have, and um, we just want to always be aware to serve others, to love others, and to um, love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Wonderful is that. Just wonderful tradition our church has. Um, welcome to Church of the Palms. Good morning. I was talking with one of the middle school leaders, and he, of course, did that as a child. It's a powerful thing, this sort of intergenerational way that our family ministry pours into people who are younger than they are. So proud of our church. If you are new here, we encourage you to visit the Welcome Center or the Connect table in the courtyard where you can get more information about who we are, what we believe, and the things that are happening here at Church of the Palms. Our website is also an excellent resource, especially for those who are worshiping with us online. We encourage you to check out our website. There are many ways to gather uh, digitally online in community and fellowship and learning. Last Sunday was our homecoming Sunday. Who ate a piece of pie? Who had more than, a, I know I won't ask, that's okay, it's okay, there's no judgment. There was a lot of delicious pie and a great Sunday, hope everyone enjoyed that. Today we'll return to our Gather and Grow teaching at 1015 in the Campus Center. I'll be talking about the practice of gratitude and some simple things we can do to incorporate gratitude into our day-to-day -day life. So hope you might join me for that at 1015 today. And then of course this week is Thanksgiving and this Wednesday Day, we gather at Temple Sinai for our annual Thanksgiving service. The reception is at 5, the service is at 6, and we hope that uh, many of us will show up there to um, gather with our brothers and sisters at Temple Sinai and give thanks for all the ways God has blessed us in our lives. 
As we enter then Advent, there are a number of important ways to serve. One of those, as the kids mentioned, uh, is to ring bells for the Salvation Army. When you do so, you're bringing awareness to the work of the Salvation Army, and you're actually collecting money as well to support the Salvation Army in their care of our homeless brothers and sisters. So hope you'll consider signing up to ring the bells. You can sign up in the courtyard with Heather, or you can sign up online to do that. Now, all of our angels have been adopted, so um, thank you for those who agreed to, to do that. I uh, want to remind you to, yes, it's wonderful that they're all adopted. I know some people might be disappointed. Um, if you did adopt, we want to remind you that you drop those gifts at the Salvation Army, not here at the church. But if you're looking for another way to pour into a child in our community who might otherwise be going without, I encourage you to look in your bulletin on page 14. We're part of a Christmas extravaganza with our friends at Light of the World International Church, and they're inviting a bunch of kids onto their campus, and you can support uh, the effort to make sure that they have a meaningful Christmas by providing gifts or gift cards for that experience. And again, you you can read more about that on page 14 in your bulletin. So let us now continue our worship.
Hope is the Thing with Feathers, a poem by Emily Dickinson. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard and sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity it asked a crumb of me. Let us now turn to God in prayer. Generous God, we come into your presence with thanksgiving. We give thanks for the beauty that surrounds us, for the beauty of the earth, for the beauty of fellowship and friendship, for the beauty of being able to love and serve others, for the beauty of life. Above all, we give you thanks for your Son, our Lord Jesus. In a word, world that wants to focus on scarcity, give us eyes to see your abundant gifts. Give us the patience and discipline to pause in our busy lives to give you thanks. Today we give you thanks for all of those who serve your church and for your children who bravely and selflessly give of themselves. We give you thanks for our mission partners who bring hope and healing to places of hurt and need. We give you thanks for your never-ending patience with us. We are humbled and we are grateful. From this place of humility and gratitude, we pray that you might equip and encourage us to sing of your generosity with the whole of our lives, with our words and with our actions. Encourage us as we seek to be healers and forgivers. Aid us in our efforts to be people who bring life into dry places. May we be so strengthened by your provision that we never rest from working toward a world where no one is hungry and no one is without clean water and no one is denied the opportunity to read your word and hear of your love. Loving God, this morning we offer prayers for your people. Shower your peace on those who are facing illness and those who love them. Comfort those who are lonely and those who have lost loved ones. Heal the brokenhearted. Give stamina and hope to those who are living with chronic pain and progressive disease. Sustain those who care for others. And Lord, we pray for your justice to rain down in places where people are bullied or victimized. We pray for those in positions of power that they might seek you first and that they might approach their leadership with hearts big enough and brave enough and humble enough to care for the well-being of all life. We pray for peace. We pray for the safety and well-being of children and those in places of war and violence, that they might feel the certainty of your love and care in their every breath. We pray all of this in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we approach Thanksgiving, we have the opportunity to reflect on the ways that God has loved us and provided for our care. The truth is that every good thing is a gift from God. The food we eat, the things we have, the time we spend, the whole of our lives. So we give our lives back to God as a way of saying thank you. Sharing money with those who are in need, giving food to those who are hungry, and spending our time to help others. So in gratitude, let us give generously what was never really ours. Let us give back that which we have been entrusted. And let us do so confidently with open hands and open hearts.
Let us pray. Gracious and generous God, in this season of gratitude, we pray that you will take these offerings, bless them, and give us the wisdom to distribute them to those who need them most in this time of gathering, so that all may feel your presence through abundance, full stomachs, and full hearts. May these gifts bring joy and peace to our sisters and brothers near and far. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Just a couple of announcements before reading the scripture today. I want to call your attention to the little chart on page 8 of your bulletin, and that uh, outlines for you all um, the um, length we need to go in order to meet our giving goal for this year. And so we invite you to continue to keep that in your mind as we prepare to reach the year's end, hoping that um, we will be able to uh, even more so support all of our ministries and our mission partnerships around the world. And also, I know this was announced earlier, but let me put another plug in for our Thanksgiving Eve service this coming Wednesday evening at Temple Sinai. This is a long-standing tradition of Church of the Palms, and it's one of my favorite services of the year where we get to be shoulder to shoulder with our dear friends of a different faith tradition, and uh, especially in this time when anti-Semitism appears to be on the rise, it is good for us to be uh, 
in solidarity with our friends at Temple Sinai. So I hope you'll, uh, if you're in town, that you'll find uh, the opportunity to join us. Five o'clock, a uh, reception to beat all receptions. And at six o'clock um, will be the service over at Temple Sinai, right over um, on uh, Proctor Boulevard. With that having been said, allow me to read our scripture from Matthew chapter 25, beginning at the 14th verse. Hear the word of God. Jesus speaks and says, For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability, and then he went away. And the one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I've made five more talents. And his master said to him, Oh, well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. And his master said to him, well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And then the one who had received the one talent also came forward saying, master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seeds. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For for to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, thrown into the, uh, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. <clears throat> By your grace and through your mercy, we pray, O oh Lord, that you will allow these words to come to point to the word just read and to the word made flesh in Jesus the Christ. For we pray this in his name. Amen. Perhaps one of the most familiar and to some one of the greatest pieces of symphonic music is Beethoven's Ninth Symphony that starts out with that great sequence of notes. Dun 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 dun. Dun 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 dun. Better if Jonathan played it, but. Oh, this. Okay, okay. Thank you. I appreciate that help. <laughs> well, after all that, it is an unforgettable piece of music. I read a while back the description of the symphony offered by one person, and she said the following. I could actually distinguish the cornets, the royal of the drums, deep toned violas and violins singing in exquisite unison. How the lovely speech of the violins flowed and plowed over the deepest tones of the other instruments. When the human voices leapt up thrilling from the surge of harmony, I recognized them instantly as voices more ecstatic, upcurving, swift and flame-like until my heart almost stood still. The women's voices seemed an embodiment of all the angelic voices rushing in a harmonious flood of beautiful and inspiring sound. Then all the instruments and voices together burst forth and died away like winds when the atom is spent, ending in a delicate shower of sweet notes. Now, I thoroughly enjoy listening to orchestral music, but there is simply no way I could come up with that kind of description for any piece of music. So it is rather humbling to know that the description I just shared with you was offered by none other than Helen Keller, totally deaf and blind Helen Keller, listening to this great music, kneeling down in her home with the cover of the speaker off and with her hand on the membrane of the speaker listening to the vibrations. This is how 
she heard the symphony composed by Ludwig, Ludwig van Beethoven, who of course was deaf when he composed it and deaf when it was performed. Now, when I first came upon that story and imagined that living room where Helen Keller sat with her family and pictured her kneeling next to the speaker with her hand on the vibrating membrane, hearing things that likely I couldn't hear today with my albeit limited hearing, it made me think about the gifts we have and the gifts we don't. The story of Helen Keller astounded the global village after at 19 months she lost both her hearing and vision from a childhood virus. At age seven, young Anne Sullivan entered her life and began to teach her how to sign, how to read Braille, and how to write. Helen Keller completed high school and entered Radcliffe College of Harvard University and became the first deaf blind person to ever receive a Bachelor of Arts degree. From there, she became a fierce advocate for the disabled. She was named by Time Magazine as one, of the most, uh, as one of the 100 most important people of the 20th century. Her story became a Broadway play and an Academy Award winning movie. Helen Keller composed a story for her life that focused on the gifts she had and not on the gifts she didn't. Which raises an interesting question. Is the story of your life focused on the gifts you have or on the gifts you don't. I think to be a human being is to be susceptible to viewing life in relative terms. I am who I am relative to those around me. That the value of my gifts is found in relationship to the value of other gifts around me. That the abundance of my gifts is determined by the abundance of gifts around me. Like that story of the man who played in the national orchestra of his country. He was a piccolo player and there came the night when the king was in the audience and the orchestra played the best it ever played and the piccolo piece was played to perfection. So well did they play that the king was overwhelmed at what he heard. And when the performance was over, the king stood up and said, this concert was so beautiful, I owe you an enormous debt of gratitude. In fact, what I will do is to show my appreciation is that I will fill each of your instruments with gold from my treasury. There there I stood, said the man in the back row, with my piccolo. <laughs> it doesn't take much to view our lives in relative terms and to be quickly discouraged by what we don't have. Maybe that's the question at hand in Jesus' great story of the servants and their talents, the three servants who have been given by their master talents to oversee while the master is gone. Talents were a lot of money. Roughly, roughly we are talking about one talent equaling, in today's money, $750,000. One servant is given five of those talents. Another servant is given two of those talents. And the third servant is given one talent. None of them are given instruction, however, over what to do with them. Just take care of them, the master says. So the five talent guy invests the five talents and makes five talents more. The second talent guy invests the two talents and makes two talents more. The third servant goes conservative and puts his one talent under his mattress. Now, if you call up a financial advisor and read him this story, you'll likely get a certain interpretation, something about investment strategy, two, one aggressive, the other one conservative, and you'll likely hear something about risk tolerance. What is your risk tolerance? Investing has a lot to do with your risk tolerance, which explains the choice that the one talent guy, the piccolo guy, makes about what to do with his one talent. He has little tolerance for risk, so he buries the talent in the ground. And maybe he's focused not on what he has to invest, but on what he doesn't. I was afraid, he says to the master upon his return. I was afraid. I saw what little I had and saw how much I didn't. And I was afraid. It's interesting, isn't it, what fear can do to the use of our gifts. Life has its way of bearing our gifts. Life has this way of making us worry more about the return on the investment than on the investment. So many of our gifts go unused because we are afraid of how they will be received. Emily Dickinson was one of the great American poets. She wrote over 1,800 poems during her short life. You heard one today, and of those 1,800 poems, she chose only to publish 10 of them, 
before she died. And the 10 she published, she felt obliged to rewrite to conform with the style of the time. She died without releasing her most treasured poems to the world. There was a season in my ministry when I baked bread for parishioners. I always thought that would be a nice gift of care and compassion, but I could never figure out how to bake a really good loaf of bread, and I took the hint when a parishioner to whom I had delivered a loaf of bread delivered back to me a week later a bread baking machine. <laughs> I took the hint and stopped baking. Our doubts are traitors, Shakespeare wrote in Measure for Measure, and make us lose the good we oft might win by fearing to attempt. I once knew a man named Chuck Matheny. I met him when I was in seminary and serving a church up in New Jersey. Chuck was born with cerebral palsy, and much of Chuck's life meant that he had to wake, work, make his way around on crutches and later a wheelchair. All his life, he suffered all the hindering symptoms of cerebral palsy. There's a lot that Chuck would have wanted to do. His parents, in response to their son's condition, built the Matheny School in central New Jersey for disabled children. And Chuck spent most of his life traveling across the world telling people about the Matheny School and telling people that there is no person born for whom God does not have a grand and glorious story. Years ago, he spoke at a high school graduation and said to those teenagers, I cannot correct the way I was born. All I know is that God allowed me to overcome my handicap and appreciate the life he's given me. I have become his tool to help others understand why they are here. Focus on what you have and not on what you don't. I was afraid, said the servant, and with that sentiment comes the assumption that the gifts that God has given us are somehow up for negotiation as to whether we use them, which of course ignores the truth about all of our gifts, and that is that God gives them to us to create a world more beautiful than it already is. God gives us our gifts to create a world more beautiful than it already is. Every unused gift, every talent buried in the ground, every skill left dormant is one less chance for the world to be as beautiful as it can be. Remember that great line from Martin Luther King Jr. when he wrote, and when you discover what you will be in your life, set out to do as if God Almighty called you at this particular moment in history to do it. Don't just set out to do a good job. Set out to do such a good job that the living, the dead, or the unborn couldn't do it any better. If it falls your lot to be a street sweeper, sweep streets like Michelangelo painted pictures. Sweep streets like Beethoven composed music. Sweep streets like Leontine Price sings before the Metropolitan Opera. Sweep streets like Shakespeare wrote poetry. Sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who swept his job well. Life is best lived according to the gifts given to us. And each one of those gifts is given that through us the world might become a better and more beautiful place. It makes me think of a painting hanging in our living room at home. It is featured on the cover of your bulletin. <clears throat> it is an original painted by a na man named Erwin Ketteman, a German painter in the first half of last century. I bet you dollars to donuts that none of you have heard of Erwin Ketteman. Who heard of er Erwin Ketteman? Ah, you all owe me donuts. <clears throat> I researched Erwin Ketteman, and as far as I've been able to discover, there's very little anybody knows about Erwin Ketteman. No one knows where he was born. No one knows where he died. No one knows about his family or whether he was married or had children. All we know is that he was a painter. And he painted a lot of paintings similar to the one on that cover, scenes primarily set in the Bavarian Alps. No one has made the case that Erwin Ketteman was of the class and rank of da Vinci or Monet or Van Gogh or Dali. No one imagines that he was even very well known in his own time. But he traipsed out among the Alps and the brooks and the snow and the flowers with his gifts and transferred the beauty around him onto the canvas before him. 
And when Mr. Ketterman sat down to paint his painting, this particular painting, how was he to know where it would go? Where would it end up? Would it end up in a trash heap? Would it end up in a storage unit? How was he to know when he set his brush to canvas what might become of his gift? But painted he did, despite not knowing its destiny, which turned out to be found in the eyes of a gentleman from America who wandered into a German studio in 1951. And his eyes fastened onto this painting, the chilly snow on the ground, the warm sun on the mountains, the persistent creek wandering through the deep. And it wasn't Da Vinci, of course, and it wasn't a Monet, of course, but he fell in love with it and wanted it at his home to look at, especially on those hot summer Pennsylvania evenings, to help him feel just a little bit cooler. The gentleman was my grandfather. And I can remember all the hours of sitting with granddad in his living room and looking at that painting. And as it turned out, his daughter, my mother, took a liking to it as well, maybe most of all because it was her father's, and maybe also because she knew the story, and maybe also because she just loved the painting. And so she <clears throat> passed that story and love onto her son, moi, into whose possession it eventually fell. Three generations in whose eyes beauty was beheld, all because one unknown artist dared to put brush to canvas. What a shame if Erwin Ketterman had decided to bury his talent in the ground. To use one's gifts, to express one's gifts is a daring thing. But at the end of the day, it is the safest of all of our bets that when we allow our gifts to be used, our talents, our creativity, our passions, our money, our time, when we allow our gifts to be used, we make the world a more beautiful place, more beautiful than it ever was. What lies under your mattress that you're not using? Your paintbrush, your bank statement, your knowledge, your wisdom, your camera, your writing, your green thumb, your love of children, your ability with math, your way around a car engine, and what are you afraid of? I suppose the only thing to be afraid of is when the master sees us and wonders why we held so much back. Dare I make this claim that the most beautiful art in the world is the art we find on our refrigerators. Painted, drawn, sketched by some little one unafraid of its destiny just so proud to use that little gift within to share something beautiful with the world and to hear the joy and praise of some loving adult. Oh, isn't this so beautiful? Let's just hang it right up here on the refrigerator for all to see. I have 30-year-old refrigerator art displayed proudly on my office desk. And don't you wonder if this is, after all, really the heart of the master who knits into us these incredible and one-of-kind gifts that he hopes someday we will display for all to see, to carry on the creation he began long ago, to make the world even more beautiful than it ever was.
now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.